everybody was kung fu fighting. Those kids were fast as lightning. In fact, it was a little bit frightening. Do, 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 do. All right, river dynasties in China. So China's geography in turn, uh, helped the early civilizations. The Yellow River created silt, helping farmers. But at the same time, like the Nile, like the Indus, the rivers were very unpredictable and could sometimes create major flooding. Now, it's very different in comparison to the past three civilizations we've looked at, whether it be the Indus, Egyptians, or the Mes in Mesopotamia, that uh, the Chinese were very isolated. Their society was very con confined to their own area and they were self-sufficient. They didn't have to trade because they didn't have a lack of natural resources, for example, like the Sumerians did. Now, the earliest dynasty was the Shia, but we don't really know much about them. That's spelled Shia with an X, X-I-A. And uh, the first dynasty we know to leave records was the Shang dynasty that existed about 4,000 years ago to about 3,000 years ago. They had these large walls to protect their cities. What's interesting is their upper class lived inside the cities while the poor lived outside. So it's kind of the opposite of today where we have very wealthy people living outside cities and the poor living in urban areas. We also see early forms of ethnocentrism. So because China did not trade, or back then the Shang Dynasty did not trade with other groups, they looked at themselves as the main culture in the world and as being the main and only civilized group that existed. Now, this concept of ethnocentrism is very interesting because it's a concept that occurs throughout history. It's not just China. It's other parts of the world, whether it be Japan, the United States, the Soviet Union. And we'll delve into this more in uh, during class time, this concept of ethnocentrism. Now, in regards to how they ran society, there was a great respect for parents. Elder males were the main ones in control, and women were expected to obey all men. That's including sons. It was during this period where the Shang began to use bronze for creating axes, creating hairpins, and the use of bronze is key because until then the main use, uh, main material used for those type of items was copper, and bronze is tougher than copper. In regards to religion, there was um, the Taoism and Confucianism had not been born yet. Um, those were born in the, the Zhou dynasty. And back then, ancestor worship and folk religion were the, was the main religion those followed in the Shang. There's an example of a picture of someone um, worshipping their ancestors. In regards to religion, part two, uh, they used oracle bones, which they would use to consult with gods. And through sc scratching the surfaces of these oracle bones, they would get answers, hints about, you know, fortunes of the future. So the relationship to uh, Korean and Japanese is very interesting because both Korean and Japanese derive from Chinese. So the Koreans, for example, adapted Chinese as a phonetic system to create their own language of Hanja. And the Japanese have a language which uses what the Japanese call kanji, which are Chinese characters. So here are those languages put next to each other. You can see especially the Chinese and Japanese are very, very uh, similar in regards to how it looks. Now the Zhou Dynasty followed the Shang from about 1000 BC to about 200 BC. And during the Zhou, we see the concept of mandate of heaven emerged. This is the belief that Rulers were given absolute authority from God, and this ha is what we call a double-edged sword because there's a positive and a negative. The positive is when you are ruling, everyone believes your rule is absolute because they think God has given you that right. But at the same time, the negative is when there's a natural disaster or the country loses a war, people will point at the heavens and say, hey, this is a sign that God doesn't want this individual to be in charge anymore. Their main format of ruling was through feudalism, where you had kings and lords who owned land. In exchange for their land, people would farm and be protected, and they would basically just live their lives as farmers without you know, any extra money. 
In regards to technology, we see the building of various roads. We also see the first type of coins to be used. And we see various weapons emerge that are very strong because I mentioned earlier they're made out of bronze and not copper. So the legacy of the Zhou Dynasty is its various inventions, whether it be the ox-drawn plows, its crossbows, its horseback riding, its various weapons made out of bronze, and it also turned out to be a very important period when it came to religion in that part of the world because we saw Confucianism and Taoism emerge around 500 BC, um, basically in the middle of the Zhou Dynasty. There's a picture of Confucius and, Ta and uh, Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism. So as you can see here, China has an immensely long history, about 4,000 years in total. In Global Studies 9, we'll be looking at four, the Shang, the Zhou, the Han, the Tang. Uh, Ming and Qing would be covered in grade 10. And as for the Xia and Qin, um, we're not going to cover them that much. The reason is the first one, uh, there's no written record, so there's not much to talk about. And as for the Qin, as you can see from this chart here, it was a very, very short-lasting empire. And finally, one other point, there's the Yuan dynasty, but the Yuan dynasty is more of Mongolian dynasty or like a Mongolian empire as opposed to a Chinese one. So yes, we will cover that with Kublai Khan, Genghis Khan, but that's um, more in uh, quarter three. And as I mentioned earlier, that's more Mongolia than China. So that just about concludes section four. This is a copyright disclaimer. Have an excellent day. Goodbye.